Welcome back. This is your host, Carter. Let's get into this. Now, this episode is going to be probably one of the most critical episodes I've made to date. What I'm going to try to do is demystify and break down the actual entire cost structure from a fixed and a variable cost if you are wanting to get into the crypto mining scene right now in 2017. We'll go through some basic predictive modeling, some basic true no kidding cost, and not just the hardware cost that you think of traditionally, like I'm gonna go out and buy a rig, or I'm gonna build a rig, and what's that gonna cost? And then you go online and you look at a, cal a calculator, and you type in some figures and you get this back and you figure, okay, there's gonna be some difficulty with regards to the difficulty of the chain you know, increasing, so I'm not gonna get exactly what it says, and you, you make an estimation, and then you get into it for a month, and then you're like, oh my God, this isn't anything what I thought it was gonna be because you have all these other additional costs. So what I'm gonna do in this video is break that down. We're gonna use this whiteboard. I got it replaced. I'll have a different video for that. This one's very tactical. This video is going to go straight through all of those kind of costs. Hardware, power, how to calculate that power cost, the actual other variable costs such as mining downtime, like when the rig is not working and you have to, you're at work or you're somewhere else and you have to come home and you have to, are there ways to mitigate that, looking at that cost, so what's the real mean on the uptime and what, what can you forecast based on that calculation to kind of give you a plan. Um, also, the additional costs that, that you will incur is if there's any hardware failures. You know, most of the hardware that you all end up buying, if you're doing a lot of the mining that we do with Ethereum or Decred or any of the other different cryptocurrencies that can still be mined with hardware that you just go out and purchase and build, you know, motherboards and processors and graphics cards and that sort of thing you will have some kind of issues every once in a while with regards to fans and some kind of level of downtime. So you have to kind of predict that, figure out what's the, what's the probability of that happening? How long? Is it an eight month window? What is that? So we'll run through a few scenarios in this, kind of lay it out for you. This is a very tactical video, like I said, and hopefully we'll keep it kind of condensed and straight and to the point, but we're gonna bring it to you today. Welcome back. And with the power of video editing, I was able to throw this up on the board for we can go through this very critical information if you are trying to get into the mining scene that we could completely understand the associated cost and the different groups that are associated to those costs both from a fixed and a variable cost standpoint so if we take what normally people come right into it and look at what is the hardware the mining rig itself extension cords essentially anything that you buy that you do not have right now to start you into this venture, then there's this cost associated to that. So if we take an example in this kind of use case that we're going through, a full mining rig of RX 480, eight gigabyte graphics cards, a cost you right now about $2,400. So right there's your $2,400 cost, 2,400. Then you got your mining operations and most people go no further than power cost and their total calculations to kind of figure out what their ultimate, their ending margin pool is gonna be and how much are they gonna earn per month. But there's more to it than that. So you get your power cost, which normally is your kilowatts per hour times your usage per hour versus your total uptime. Now, usually in these calculators, it's just assuming a 24 hour usage at whatever rate you're paying in your particular area times the current usage. So you can go online, there's lots of different tools to go out there and just find out what your rate is, put in what your average power usage is that you can use with like a kilowatt, shameless plug for one of those, and then do not use 24 hours because most of the time your rig is not going to be up for 24 hours, you may get a few days, you may even go two weeks. Uh, but bottom line, I usually go when I'm working with folks locally here and just estimate about 80% because if the rig needs a, a card switched out or something to that, that's roughly about 19.2 hours, which in this can particular calculation is about $1.37 per day, roughly $41 a month. If this rig ran 80% of the time pulling of the 900 watts that this rig pulls right now on Ethereum, mining. So that gives you kind of a basic breakdown of how much that thing's going to cost you. It's going to cost you about $41 a month to run. 
But these are the other areas below that we're gonna go ahead and zoom in on that also get calculated, that usually do not get calculated when people are kind of modeling out what are going to be the cost, which really eat against the margin pool that you're gonna be pulling in. And you need to kind of calculate as part of that. You have pool fees. So when the moment you point this mining rig to a pool, which is a shared resources uh, type of setup, it's where you, along with a whole bunch of other folks, are going to mine in a pool for a chance to win the different blocks that come out. You will get a distribution based on your effort that you're putting into that pool. And we'll go through a whole other video on actually the mechanics of how a pool works. I'll draw it out. I'll explain each piece slowly. But bottom line, there is a fee. So whatever your output is, so ignore the technical piece of this right now. Just understand that if you have this rig pointed to a pool, you are going to pay a fee on whatever your share of the output is. So right now you can get 2% pools. I mean, the pools usually define what, the, what their costs are or lower. You can find some that don't charge anything. They just ask for you to give some of your contribution. Um, usually when I'm on there, I'm usually doing one to 2%. If we're pointing rigs to a pool, I think that's fair. They, they took effort. They have cost that they have to pay for. Um, so that's a, that's a normal 1.5, 1%, 2% is a good fee. Then you have your mining software. Now this is relatively new, at least with the old Bitcoin mining back in 11 and 12. There are a lot of the stuff you could compile yourself and start mining. Um, the newer ones are very optimized. People take developer time to create and optimize for these particular algorithms with these particular pieces of hardware. So for them to get compensated for their effort, they bake in into the tool itself, into the compiled version of the mining software that you will download, that you will use this rig using this software to have you participate in the, the entire mining process against this pool. So th the newer mining software, some of them do have fees built into them too. So as it's going through and it's, it, it's submitting shares of its effort that your, your mining rig has helped on a block, part of that reward will get extracted and sent to that miner. So part of the, the hashing effort. So right there, you got 4% of your output, your potential output right there is, is that's out of your margin. So you already have your sunk cost on your hardware. This is out of your actual effort that you're earning. It's 4%. Think of it kind of like a tax. Like you've, you're, you're on the pay that you're receiving. If you're a taxi driver and you bought a car, like an Uber, and you have your sunk cost on your car, this is your operations cost when you're, when you're using your car. An additional tax paid for by the pool and the mining software. So then you have your transaction fees. So this is whenever you set your transaction to send you every time you get one ETH contribution in from this pool, you're gonna pay a small fee on sending that one ETH. So you're gonna get 0 0.99, maybe eight ETH, and that 0 0.02 is gonna be a transaction fee that you pay back in to part of the distribution of this network. Some pools will have additional fees if you try to send a lower amount. They'll say, yeah, we'll let you take out at 0 0.5 ETH, but we're gonna charge you an additional fee because we're having to pay the transaction fees or they'll have more costs. It's just more overhead on their system if every time you're paying out at a lower denomination. Usually we do five ETH well, we'll, we'll have them auto send and pay, try to lessen the amount of transaction fees that we'll have. Now this is pretty low compared to like a full ETH. It's not like a whole 2% of a single ETH, um, but it is another fee that gets tacked on. And then you got the exchange fee. So let's say you go through all this effort, you get it to a personal wallet. So the ETH that you're earning on your mining rig configured to this pool at post paying for your fees, you'll have a balance. In, this, in a pool, you're gonna have a balance that you can send to your wallet. When you go and do that and you, you send it to your wallet, you're paying part of that transaction fee. 
when you want to send that to an exchange, because let's say you want to convert your Ethereum right over to Bitcoin, the exchange is going to have a trade fee, usually 0.5%. So a very small amount, you know, so not a huge fee, but again, another part of that margin. So just the calculated known, known fees. And you can essentially consider it with Bitcoin, the transaction fees are a little higher and that's part of the current ongoing issues. But if you're looking from just an Ethereum standpoint, you're at, at a minimum set right now with this at let's just say that other part of the fee was the zero three so you're looking at almost five percent that out of your your gross think of it like gross revenue that this machine is generating you are paying a line item here of taxation and this isn't to discourage anybody this is to break down there's costs associated with all this Yes, Bitcoin, yes, these these cryptocurrencies provide a platform and a massive reduction to infrastructure cost across the board, and it's going to be disruptive and evolutionary. However, there's still going to be fee structures through the different participating parties in their, their particular portion. So if you have a, a mining rig that you are contributing to the grand network of everything else, the transactions you're gonna have a basic transaction fee. That's kind of what helps pay for the network. Once the deflationary model of Bitcoin with the coins hit their 21 million, these transaction fees are gonna be the things being paid out every 10 minutes. This is what keeps the network paid. So as we use it, these transaction fees, once there's 21 million Bitcoins, every 10 minutes, the sum of all those transaction fees are redistributed back to the mining community. So that is, that's in essence, this is, this is a self-perpetuating revenue generation machine that does have its components and you do have to pay into it. Now this isn't to, to disenchant any of anybody, it's just again to, to expose how the fee structures work. So now you're looking at your total revenue reduced by about that to pay for that kind of networking piece. Now, that's, I'd like to say that's all, but essentially there's a few more little variable costs that I'm just gonna throw in there. And what I mean by variable cost, effectively you have potential failures on hardware. If you're going to be mining yourself, you set up that rig, you spend $2,400, you pay your power costs and stuff, you may have over a period of time, month one through let's say month eight, you may, lose one of your GPUs. Rig keeps freezing up. You're trying to figure out what's going on. You spend a couple hours diagnosing, you know, the problem and find out one of your GPUs down. So out of a, you know, out of six card rig, you know, you're down roughly 20%. Well, a little less than that. On a five card rig, you'd be down 20%. You know, so let's say now you're, now you're running at 85% of your rig because you have one GP down that you got to send off. So again, that's another that's another reduction in your total hash rate. So if you're at 180 mega hash and now you're dropping to 135 to 140, you need to replug those calculations in to figure out kind of where you're at and how much is this downtime costing you. And this is just a reality. It's one of those things that, you know, if you can get eight strong months with nothing wrong with the rig at almost 80% uptime or more, you're gonna at current rates and as it's been going on since 2013, there is a great chance you're gonna completely pay this rig off right now. Even with the, the instability with cryptocurrency. For the, for the entire time that we've been mining, actually since 20, 2011, the only time that it really was not very profitable, um, around 2011 through uh, mid, I think it was February, 2012. Maybe it started to kind of get more, more and more profitable on GPUs and that was on, on um, Bitcoin. But not to get on a tangent here, this is, this is a, a cost of potential failure to have in, have in your calculations. Again, you have a general downtime, which is 
reducing your margin. So this is kind of the same thing. This potential failure will reduce the amount of, you know, could potentially take the whole machine down, which will remove, reduce your total, your total uptime, which mind you, that's going to reduce your cost on power because the machine's off, but you're not now generating revenue. So it's kind of a self-defeating thing. So well, yes, while your monthly $41 extra power cost on one machine is not costing anything, you're not generating any money because your machine's off. So going in, taking all these variable costs and all this together will give you a better estimation, which is the real goal here is to show folks the components that go into this cost and then go through an exercise on how much potential revenue. And I like doing eight month models where you're going to have a certain amount of ETH coming in that will naturally decline because one of the other cost components here, which I don't put as normal a cost component, but it is just a variable uh, calculation that you need to put in there is you have network complexity. Normally if understood as its hash rate increases, making the difficulty increase, which means your 180 mega hash that you have effectively is less effective or it has less of output. Let's just say output is a better way to put it of what it potentially could. So if you averaged on this kind of rig in 2017, April, with the current network hash rate of Ethereum, you're gonna generate up to 2.1 ETH a week. That's, let's say, that's your target there. 2.1 Ethereum per week. Here, depending on how the network increases its hash rates, its total network hash rate and its difficulty goes up, let's say it goes up exponentially and it goes up 40%. The curve is more like this and not so linear, but you will, let's say, go down to essentially point zero point nine ETH after month eight a week. So the summation of how much total ETH you're going to earn over those over those those months. So you're looking at a total of one to eight eight months. 32 weeks total you just do your math there so it's going to be descending it's going to be 2.1 2.0 let's just kind of do it linear 2.0 of each of the weeks so 32 weeks out total of that and we're not doing the math right here right now we'll we'll edit So that will equal a model, which we'll go ahead and bring up on the screen here real quick, just to kind of show you of what that kind of looks like. Yeah, I have a dream.